thanks a lot for, for coming. Um, yeah, I'm Yuri Lelli, working at ARM, and basically the last couple of years I've been uh, part of the uh, ES project. And basically today I'm going to present you uh, the modification we basically did it to the, let's say, the upstream uh, version of this uh, thing uh, before you can actually land on the Android common kernel. Uh, yeah, you understand during the presentation what the main line, I mean, what are the different code lines and uh, what does it, this mean? Anyway, let's get started. So, uh, since there is not really much time uh, to actually talk about everything we need to talk, I'll be quite briefly on introducing what ES is. So hopefully you're already uh, kind of comfortable with it. Uh, it's probably not the first time you heard about it. But if it is, basically the high level overview, the recap, or what is it? It's basically the idea of uh, since you have a system topology, so have a notion about the topology of your system, and then you have some workloads that actually run on the system, then you can combine the two information and basically the task scheduler can actually work, uh, combine those information to provide you frequency selection, so OPP uh, clock frequency selection, CPU selection, so where to schedule your tasks, and also idle state, idle state selections. And basically, providing those three things at the same time, it uh, generates uh, higher performance, but still saving energy. So the, the focus here for ES in general, it's all uh, being basically trade off between uh, performance as energy, it's not only performance oriented. Yeah, that's basically uh, the high level review of this thing. So that is a yes, so but why yes, so why we did this kind of new thing? Um, I guess the main point is that uh, in Linux, uh, there are like different subsystems working uh, yes together, but there is no a real holistic uh, entity that does uh, the, the decisions in a join up way. So we actually needed that, we implemented a mechanism to do a join up power pair management across the different subsystem of the kernel. Um, it also, if you don't consider the energy aspect, it also gives you sensible uh, defaults for performance, uh, considering different uh, capacity, CPU with different capacities like uh, big little asymmetric systems. And it's basically an optional alternative to the uh, the fold Linux scheduler CFS policy, which is only throughput based, so it also considers energy. So it's basically an addition to the default policy. And it gives you also a simplified tuning interface. So uh, some level of tuning uh, to get the, basically the numbers you need uh, to ship your product will be still required. But that, I mean, the situation will be much improved and much simpler than before once ES gets uh, widely adopted. So basically what it gives you is the possibility to, uh, to have some coupling between a runtime aware user space and the kernel in well-defined ways, ways. So we basically also define a nice and clean interface or API uh, with which user space in this time, uh, runtime and the kernel can actually talk with each other and exchange information. And yeah, that's basically uh, why uh, ES is actually landed on the Android Como. Como kernel. Yay! So yeah, it's actually not, I mean, this point, I want to stress this point because it's not uh, like a nice, uh, nice thing for us, I mean, that we develop the thing. It, I think it's a nice thing for the, for the ecosystem uh, as, as a whole. Because basically we we raised little we raised the bar uh, from which you get to start to actually tune your system and to ship it, and uh, it's uh, the, the focus is on mainline. So not right now, but in few I mean in few uh, uh, months, in few years, we get uh, Linux to be already uh, more ready to be used for products. So it's a big win for everybody. I I think. Okay. So what's, what has been the story so far? So this thing actually uh, dates back uh, some years ago. I guess the, 
the really starting point uh, has been the famous, infamous, I don't know, uh, line in the sand by Ingo Warner, so one of the Shadler Linux Shadler maintainers. You cannot probably read what he was uh, uh, saying on the main release, but basically what he wanted was uh, a single holistic way to actually have uh, the, uh, I mean, a single place, uh, the place being the Shadler that controls all the power aspects and also performance. And that's basically what we are, we, uh, try to design in the following years. This is, has been uh, basically a joint effort between uh, ARM, Dinaro, and uh, other uh, community members. Uh, I guess the community is still can somewhat uh, small, but it's uh, raising, so increasing the in number of people. Um, here, basically, I just put the main uh, bits of what has been already achieved, so achieved the main line, so Linux main line. What's on flight? Uh, I guess, yeah, I can just skim through, through the different points on this slide. Uh, the light blue ones it means that they are uh, RFCs, so patches proposed in mainline for discussion, or uh, in-flight patches. Uh, so the last RFC of the whole stack of patches for ES uh, was uh, dating back uh, last year in July. And then after that, we decided to uh, take a different way, but I'll talk about this afterwards. And then uh, we get some foundation patches merged. And then uh, I guess the other big bit is the uh, coupling with uh, CPU Freak. We had this implementation called Shell Crack, and then happened uh, suddenly that uh, basically the very same, the implementation of the, of the very same idea uh, got merged in mainline. And uh, right now, basically, the in-flight patches currently are Morton and Dietmar uh, symmetric capacity support for CPU. So it's basically the performance only aspect of this thing. And uh, I'm following the expression in DT of the energy model. But I think this will be uh, clearer as we uh, go through the slides. All right. If, I, if you have any question, I guess just ask, I mean, don't wait for the presentation to end. All right, so that was really the introductory uh, part of the presentation. So what's the agenda for today? I'll basically still keep uh, talking a little bit of, uh, about ES and what it is, like really high level, but still we need some more details to appreciate what comes next. Then uh, I'll uh, spend much more time on the Android Common Kernel Adaptation background because it's basically the, the meat of this presentation. And then I'll talk about uh, basically the, the yeah, upstream and product code lines, so what we think is the right way to, to proceed from here. And then uh, how can you get involved? Right, so this is the detailed view. It's also called the scary pictures. Uh, not Sure, so it's scary, but that's basically all the components that are part of this uh, ES uh, mechanism. So instead of just staying here, I guess it's easier uh, for someone that doesn't uh, know what ES is to understand really three main blocks that compose the whole thing. So we have, I mean, the, the biggest uh, block is what we call ES core. And this core basically is composed by uh, code in the Linux shell CFS wake up path, uh, where we actually use information uh, about performance and power to make scheduling decisions. And this information comes from uh, the ARC uh, layer, so where we actually have the energy model expression. This energy model that describes your uh, topology and the uh, power uh, characteristics of, of your platform comes from DT. Uh, and then it also, this information is also used, uh, the CIE and FIE means uh, uh, CPU invariant engine and frequency invariant gene. Basically, uh, they actually are able to frequency and capacity scale the load tracking mechanism that we actually uh, use to make informed decision. Also, this I'll, also about this I'll talk about later. But basically, those are the main uh, components of the IS core. So yeah, it's basically asymmetric capacity support and energy model driver driven task placement. 
Then come Shepfrec, at least in the product code line. And uh, Shepfrec is basically the missing link between Shadowver and uh, CPU Freak. So uh, usually you have a CPU Freak governor that does uh, his own uh, decisions regarding OPP changes completely separated from the Shadowver. What we implemented, and uh, as said, this is us, but also Linaro, uh, effort is basically uh, make this link so the scheduler can now uh, ask for a particular OPP and the thing will be basically uh, using the CPU frag drivers will be actually uh, make work. And then uh, we have Shetune, which is basically the single tuning mechanism that I was talking about before. So a way uh, basically, it's a, yeah, it's a mechanism, so it's an API you can actually use to try to tune differently your platform depending on uh, what's, what's running on, on it. And uh, this is supposed to be actually used by user space, so that's really the, the, the linkage between kernel space and user space. And of course, the, the idea is that uh, moving the gear that corresponds ideally to Shetune you're actually able to move uh, Shellfrec and ES core. So you're actually influencing not only uh, frequency selection, but also CPU selection, so Shellulin decisions at the same time. Okay, that's, yeah. So what kind of information are you passing uh, in the device tree in? Uh, are you gonna go into any more detail on that? From the device tree, um, the information that you're passing in for EAS, um, what all is that describing? Is it just still the hardware description? Or are you? I see there's an energy model block up there. Are you also containing yeah. some of that? So uh, basically, currently we have uh, in the in these uh, DT bindings, which are not upstream, they are for, for product. What we desc describe is basically uh, the for the active uh, state. So OPPs of your platform, you have uh, like a capacity uh, given by that OPP, so how much CPU uh, bandwidth that OPP gives you, and an associated power. And then you have basically the same thing, uh, well, you don't have capacity, but you have like a power associated to the different other states, and so you can couple uh, those information to make uh, scheduling decisions. Those are basically the main point. That's basically what the energy model is. Okay. So, uh, here we go with the, with the meat of the presentation. That's, yeah, that's about all right. So what we, well, well, yes, first of all, it's why we actually need to change something. So why the, what we had wasn't uh, enough for a real product or for the Android common kernel. Basically, the baseline is what we call uh, ES 5.2 plus. It's kind of funky uh, versioning system, but basically, for for you, it's uh, ES v5 was the last uh, code line released on Linux kernel mini list. Then the 5.1 was a minor uh, update, and the 5.2 basically it's after a rewrite of the load tracking uh, signal in Linux. So we had to change something. And then the plus, there were uh, really changes that we made uh, servicing another, uh, it was a Chrome OS thing going on and we had to make those changes. But that's basically considered it being a baseline. So uh, this expression was, I mean, good for the mainline because uh, we were receiving positive feedback from mainline, but not quite there for Android. So it basically, yeah, uh, those four points are the main, uh, uh, problems with that code line. So, one, yeah, the first problem was that uh, performance, uh, as Linux uh, considered it, was still uh, about throughput and not uh, latency, which is uh, quite different. So, since uh, on Android, on mobile workloads in general, latency uh, is really important, we need to make some uh, adjustment to service the kind of uh, requirements. Then uh, the classic, I mean, the basic design was really, I mean, was general, but uh, still uh, uh, kind of always thinking about uh, classical big little system. 
there are uh, there are implementations, silicon implementations there are which are not big little, so we needed to make changes to service those uh, as well. And um, yeah, another big point was that uh, basically the load tracking mechanism of the uh, mainline Linux scheduler is basically servicing quite good uh, server desktop type of workloads. Uh, maybe it is not this, it is not the case for. Uh, mobile workloads, so another mechanism was introduced to service those workloads better. And uh, yes, uh, basically we went ahead and implemented this uh, single tuning knob that maintainers ask for. Actually we did it a little bit more because it's uh, also C group based, so it's not really already a single one. But also having this uh, single thing was probably too simplistic, so we needed to add Another tuning knob. Those are basically the uh, the reason why we needed we needed uh, those changes. So what was the was was the approach to come up with those changes? And uh, I think that's uh, another uh, point worth worth stressing here, because uh, basically the primary focus uh, dri driving the those uh, iterative approach in changing uh, bits and pieces was uh, really uh, try to understand what was the problems uh, of workloads that matters for the particular product. And in this case, basically, we, uh, our primary focus was on UX type of workloads, so which are in general latency sensitive, like YouTube, uh, camera record, or still uh, there, I mean, UI bench is still, uh, I mean, it's not really a real application, but still mimics uh, the behavior of re-applications, like you can scroll list and this, do this kind of stuff, which is basically what Android is basically doing. So uh, the approach was really iterative. So the way we did it, we run the baseline. So we started with 5.2 plus, run this thing through Lisa, which is basically the tooling uh, uh, we actually develop internally and then and now is uh, publicly available on GitHub to actually extract, I mean, run workloads and then extract uh, data from them. Uh, if you are more interested uh, on the tooling aspects of this story, uh, make sure you follow. I think it's after this that we, yeah, there is a necking session. Mandrit, okay. Yeah, so make sure you, you follow the team because we have updates on, on these bits as well. All right, so we run the baseline, then you figure out uh, that something is not working as you expected. Uh, that might be by just inspecting the trace. So you collect these trays and see uh, frames, junk frames, for example. Or uh, you measure performance or you actually perceive that the, the performance is not acceptable. So then you have to go there and think, okay, what, what can I change, of course. So there's some brainstorming. You come up with a change, propose a patch, and then, well, if you rerun the same workload, so you compare with baseline and everything is good, so you solve the problem and that's it, ship it. But if it's not, I mean, this is a really iterative approach and the tooling that we actually have helps a lot in uh, performing these tasks. Uh, of course, we didn't forget the uh, competitive type benchmark type of application. So Geekbench, Vellamo, we also care about them. Uh, but yeah, as I said, the primary focus was on UX. And also, I uh, would like to stress that, well, latency is one side of the aspect, the energy is actually the other uh, bits that you care about. So it's always a trade-off between uh, the latency you achieve uh, and the energy you uh, actually you use to achieve that latency, right? Yeah. Uh, platform you are using to debug and uh, optimize? Uh, you mean uh, how we figure out that something else is not working, uh, how we then verify that the thing is actually working after a change? Yeah, uh, I have noticed that uh, uh, different CPU topology may in fact uh, the result of your, of your optimization. Mm -hmm. So, 
or I want to know what uh, platform you are using and uh, what's the CPU topology is. So, uh, well, well, I guess the next slide probably explain it because I mean, here I'm showing some of the uh, performance gathering aspect and this basically has been uh, uh, running on uh, high key board. So high key is a 96 flat board platform. Uh, it's uh, basically an SMP system. So that kind of topologies. All those changes should fit in any kind of SMP or SMP-like type of topologies. Okay. Yeah. And what's the slide? No. Okay. Okay. So yeah. Uh, actually, I wanted to show you a simple example of uh, the uh, basically how we collect data, how we actually work on this data, and try to understand what I mean if there is a problem or not. So here uh, you see um, data from uh, several runs of list view, which is uh, part of the chunk bench uh, benchmark that I was uh, talking about before. It's basically simple list crawling type of uh, app. And here, this is just an example, so I won't enter in much details, but uh, basically here we, we compare the fra frame rendering duration time, so how much time it says required to render a frame versus the number of samples. And so this is basically a, com a cumulative distribution of the rendering of the different frames. Uh, this is comparing different uh, configurations, but basically what is interesting for us is, for example, that uh, starting from that point onwards, you actually have uh, start experience junk frames because basically the, the dotted red line, it's the 60 millisecond deadline for the rendering of a frame. So each frame that goes above that limit is basically jankiness. So you don't, ideally you don't want any frame to be janky. Uh, so that's basically the first thing that tells you, okay, there is something wrong. And then you, of course, you have to collect traces and understand what's, what's not working and fix it. The other point here is that it's not only about averages that we usually uh, care about, but also like uh, other statistical properties like the 99 percentile. So it's really a statistical type of uh, approach. So it's not just a single uh, result that you get, ju not just a single number. It's really a statistical thing. And uh, yeah, I mean, as I said, th those are, uh, I was running uh, different code lines on, uh, yeah. Yeah, so the different colors in this case are different configurations. So here I was running on a high keyboard. Actually, I want to thank uh, John and Steve also for making this uh, easy to, to achieve. And uh, here I was uh, running uh, the same workload with uh, different uh, uh, CPU thread governors. So for example, the violet line is performance governors, and then you have interactive, shed util, shed frag, just to be able to compare the performance of the different governors. So each line is a different configuration, basically. So here I just, uh, I was just switching the governor, but you can in principle do whatever type of comparison you care about. Usually it's baseline, I guess, something uh, that you change. Uh, in this case, it's a different configuration of the governor, CPU frag governor. But in general, yes, can be different configuration options or whatever you, you want. Yeah, but that just to highlight uh, the type of uh, results we were getting, and if you're uh, interested in this kind of thing, I'll be uh, having an acting session, I think, uh, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, I don't remember, about uh, basically coupling shed util uh, with the score. So I have more of this stuff to, to show you. Okay. So, uh, what we actually modified. Uh, if you remember, this was the scale picture, and I basically highlighted in light blue uh, the bits that we actually we modified or we added to the picture. So the wake up path, shed frag, and shed two was already present in the uh, in the baseline. And what we added is basically the world uh, load tracking mechanism, thanks to our Python uh, friends, and uh, then the coupling with user space. Uh, which also, yeah, uh, next slide. Okay. 
what was what was the target platform you used to to do your development and testing? Uh, so uh, basically, this is a, a customer platform. Uh, cannot really talk about the platform itself, but basically, those modifications I was uh, saying before they are still they still matter for, for example, IT, the IT board. It's uh, uh, easily available, and actually, those modifications still matters should still matter for that platform. So we, of course, targeted a particular uh, product, which, which, which we cannot talk about right now, but this thing is general uh, for this kind of topologies. So I'd say SMP, SMP-like type of topologies. What, what uh, ARM uh, version was it? I mean, was it uh, an A53, A72? And I'll now talk uh, about them separately. So, first thing is the uh, world. So, Windows assists a load tracking mechanism. So, it's basically an alternative to the uh, current Linux load tracking mechanism, which is called Felt, uh, which basically gives you, uh, basically keeps tracks or task demand and uh, CPU's utilization. So, it's actually useful to do scheduling decision. Uh, Again, I can't give you much details because I don't have time. You, this thing requires hours easily. Uh, but I think uh, you guys have uh, a talk about this in the next days. So be sure you be sure you attend. Also, there is a next session about Pelt as well. I'll recap all the the stuff in the last slide. So and. Um, yeah, basically, we, we also kept the Pelt one in the code line, so we, we didn't uh, switch between the two. So in the code line, you actually have uh, a configuration time option and a pro proc FS uh, tunable uh, with which you can switch between the two uh, for comparison or for uh, uh, because you need it. Um, so, so why we needed this thing, this little uh, bit? Basically because, uh, well, th that was really a... Uh, testing, so we did limited device testing. This show uh, better performance and energy uh, numbers. So that's why we actually decided to to bring this in as part of the of the picture. Um, of course, this is uh, known. Uh, it is it is not the main line currently. So we have basically plans uh, to basically be able to use this. I mean, to for it or something like it to be part of main line. Uh, always think that everything that we that we do is also it, it is targeting products, but it's also focusing mainline. So we we need always to think about the two uh, code lines. In this case, basically, there is uh, currently a discussion happening on this mini list called ESDev. I'll have uh, more information afterwards. Obviously, it's a kind of uh, it's a I said it's a small community, smallish community. So we have this mini list, which is not. Uh, uh, on the Linux kernel mini list currently, we, where we did discuss about things also because we can discuss about product or code lines, so it's not only main line, it's uh, easier to, uh, to participate here. And um, yeah, we are discussing an, an upstream friendly version of this thing, and uh, uh, hopefully we will be able to post uh, a version of Vault in, on the Linux kernel mini list. Uh, together with this, we actually uh, did several modifications on top of Pelt or fixes to Pelt to try and make it uh, more uh, uh, mobile friendly. I mean, to basically try to replicate and close gaps uh, with respect to Vault. And uh, I guess the plan there is try, I mean, continue evaluating uh, the difference between the two and see if we can come up with something on, up on mainline which is better for everybody. And yeah, as I said, uh, please make sure you attend the hacking session and also the presentation uh, later on this week. Right, then next bit was Shetune. So, uh, 
share to you basically the main modification were uh, to uh, the negative boosting. I talk about negative boosting first. Uh, so the boosting was already thought to be positive, so zero hundred. But then uh, we realized actually uh, that uh, it might be uh, worth having also a kind of negative boosting. So if you have uh, background non-latency sensitive tasks and you want to keep, uh, for example, your frequency low or you want to schedule them, I mean, try to uh, tune them to run on a lethal CPU, you can actually put them in a negative boost uh, group and they will be accordingly scheduled. So that was a nice addition. And which doesn't require uh, another tuning knob. I mean, you see in the same tuning knob, but extend it in the other direction. And then we actually needed a new tuning knob called Prefer Idle. Uh, to be able to service uh, the desire for low latency wake-ups. So in this case, uh, tasks that are part of the group with this uh, flag set will be basically trying to be put on uh, an adult CPU. Uh, but I guess we'll be more clear afterwards when I, when I actually talk about the wake-up part. Yeah, it's a flat approach, but I'll talk about that uh, like next slide is basically talking about this. But those are the main views. And uh, so plans for uh, moving forward from here, it's, uh, well, a main thing is to try to improve the definition of the power uh, performance trade-off uh, Shetune is currently implementing. So we realized that there were like, uh, there is probably a more general uh, approach and implementation of the same idea. So we, were act we are actually working on, uh, Pazix is actually working on extending this idea. And maybe by extending this idea, we will probably be able to remove, for example, the preferred other flag. Hard to, I mean, early to, to see if it's possible, but we still try to keep that one single knob uh, idea. And yes, one of the plan is to post uh, an updated RFC on Linux Canary list. So the last RFC uh, is, they did uh, last year, so it's time that we post a new uh, IFC on a mini list. Also because uh, the interface as well, based, being based on Cgroup, might be, might be posing problems for the upstream community, so it's good if we have that discussion if we, before we move forward. Ah, yes, and also at LPC next month, we'll be uh, discussing and presenting this idea to foster further, yes. Okay, let me just go here, because here it's actually where it's used, so it will be clearer. So the task wake up path, it's actually the, uh, where the, basically the big bulk of changes are, and basically what, that's the part that we actually change the most, change the most. Uh, we introduced a ProcFS uh, tuning knob called Shed is Big Little, to be able to actually differentiate the behavior and their heuristics uh, based on your knowledge of the topology. So if you have uh, an SMT, SMT like type of topology, you need to set this flag to zero. Instead, if you are in a big little system, uh, you keep it one. And uh, when you select this to be zero, basically in the wake up path, you'll be executing, you'll be calling the find best target function, which basically incorporates all the changes that we actually uh, made in this uh, product code line. Uh, what are? Uh, so basically how the uh, selection heuristic has been changed. So first, we, when we enter the function, we actually establish if a task is boosted and or if it prefers idle CPU. So to respond to your question, if it has, if, it, if the group is actually in, has the prefer idle bit uh, flag set. And uh, then uh, we do basically all CPUs or the system are considered, so it's basically a flat CPU uh, uh, type of heuristics. So because uh, the original ES heuristic was actually selecting a cluster before and then select the CPU be inside the cluster. Here we basically consider the topology to be flat and we actually try uh, all the CPUs in the system. Uh, we actually start considering, uh, I mean, we start from the first CPUs if the task is non-boosted or from the last CPU if the task is boosted. 
Now, uh, this makes only sense if uh, you still have some differences in the uh, CPU size of your topology. And it, yes. Yeah, it's actually, it's kind of, yeah, it, it's actually the, the CPU ID. So here we actually assume that your, uh, the CPU with the highest ID are the most performant one. And then uh, basically this thing helps you uh, not selecting the same CPU for booster and non-booster tasks. So booster tasks will still consider more performant CPUs, non-booster tasks will start from the least. Uh, it's a yeah, little CPU, yes, yeah, yeah, that's the assumption. Um, then, uh, basically, CPU is uh, chosen looking at the task boost utilization, so the task has to fit the preferred idle flag and the CPU capacity and current utilization of the different CPUs. In what way, basically, we discard CPUs uh, in where the task doesn't fit. So if they don't have spare enough spare capacity for the task, of course. Uh, then uh, we select the first idle CPU if the preferred idle is set, and this adds uh, wake up latencies. So we prefer idle CPUs effectively. And then uh, uh, basically if there is enough capacity at the current OPP, uh, for uh, preferred idle, uh, task, we select the CPU with the lowest utilization, so it's the more idle CPU in the system, or the highest utilization if the flag, flag is not set, so it's the least uh, idle CPU in the system. We, this way we can actually make, uh, with a single heuristics, we can uh, accommodate different type of uh, booster and non-booster task, so different type of uh, task needs. Uh, yeah, the last important bit is that uh, for if the task is actually boosted or if it prefer, prefer idle, we basically skip the energy model. Uh, uh, we don't use the energy model at all. So we just select the, the CPU and that helps for latency. And uh, here again, uh, yeah, that's basically it for the, the wake up task. Faster. Okay, so <laughs> why uh, we need this? Because uh, yeah, uh, maybe for uh, non-bilinear topology doesn't fit, and then plant is to try to converge uh, back to a single wake-up path, even for mainline. We're, we're already going that way. Uh, yeah, for ChefRec is really briefly we just changed the go to max policy instead of going to really max. We basically incrementally step up, and then we introduced two throttling thresholds up and down to basically be able to quick respond for to a sudden increase in the band and be able to have some hysteresis on brief drops, and that helps uh, both uh, energy savings and responsiveness. And the plan is actually to uh, Steve is already in basically doing this work is to uh, to basically port those features on shed util and then switch to use shed util both for mainline and products in the future. And uh, yeah, user space interaction between uh, kernel and user space. Uh, I guess the main point is that now the tuning happens uh, by a single localized surface, which is an improvement uh, with respect to the past. And uh, please attend John's uh, talk because he's basically entering in the details of what's happening. I just give you a simple example so that there is uh, kind of you have four CPUs on your system. Uh, I think John has something like that, but just to depict what what is happening. So activity manager in Android divides your task in background, foreground, and top app, depending on what's running. And here, for example, we have different uh, defaults for the different groups. So you can select prefer idle, boost, uh, independently. Here you see that the top up always has a 10 boost. So the tasks running there are always a little bit boosted. But for example, when there is a batch interaction on the device, we actually switch uh, the boost and we increase the boost so they are actually uh, achieving better performance. And that happens automatic automatically with, uh, with Android. Okay, this is just. No, no, this is a pair, we use C, C groups. So it's per a per group uh, thing. Yeah. So according to your earlier presentation, I wonder if I should be excited to have this kind of conversation. 
Yeah, no, it was saying that uh, it might be worth having uh, a negative boosting for the background. It actually, yeah, might be, might be true. It depends on. Uh, the suggestion was to to use negative boosting for the background group, which might make sense. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, what's the plan for mainline and product code lines? So for the mainline, the mainline strategy uh, has been for the last year uh, to basically split this huge patch set, composed of more than 40 patches, I guess, uh, after ESV5 was on the list, and basically push a uh, subset on uh, mainline one after the other. And uh, together with this, we're still maintaining on ARM Linux power dogged uh, repository and, and upstream aligned uh, set of patches that uh, you can play with if you care about mainline or you start with. Uh, but uh, basically there is no, uh, I mean, we, we keep pushing stuff on mainline uh, incrementally. That's basically uh, the strategy. For, for product code lines, basically we have now the 380 and 4.4 Android common kernel uh, product code lines. Uh, Likely there will be the next one will be Android 409, but we don't really know now. And then we also have the LSK uh, uh, expression of the same thing with the board uh, support, like for example, Juno or this kind of platform support. And how it works, uh, it's uh, following this kind of uh, circle. So basically for products, the upstream is AO speed, then basically those changes, I mean the code line there calculate to LSK and uh, basically the downstream and where development happens because you have to run actually your thing on a Juno for example, happens on LSK. Patches and improvement fixes are actually discussed on uh, ES dev because we can talk about products, the code lines there without any problem. And then uh, basically after the, patch, the patches are reviewed and uh, approved, they go through IOSP get it and after comprehensive testing and further review, they uh, hopefully get to AOSP again. And then uh, that's how uh, this thing is supposed to work in the future. Right, so just to conclude how you might want to get involved and please do. Uh, if you want, I mean, the best thing for mainline is to test the patches, review them, and actually respond to the patches themselves with a tested by. If you can, I mean, if you really run the thing on a, on a platform, you say this is good. So, for example, Freedom did it in the past and was great. Uh, or just review the thing and make your comments. So it's also uh, an indication to the maintenance there are people. Uh, maybe outside the community is actually discussing this in the care about the patches. So it's a great help. So please do. Or you can uh, actually uh, push patches to the common kernel and get them reviewed. That would be another uh, way to get involved. Or participate in the ES dev many lists. You can discuss uh, both upstream or product code line uh, patches. Or you can reach us uh, always on Leonardo, ES, RC, Chan. We are almost always uh, there. Not many people, but still, <laughs> still there. Okay, that's basically it for me. Those are the sessions. Uh, I think uh, they are worth attending in the next uh, in this week. So please uh, come again. Right. So I would take advantage of with the microphone in my hand. Yeah. Okay. Uh, ask the first question. So I think earlier. Uh, if I heard it correctly, you were saying that uh, you were tuning EAS for two architectures, big or little, and the other seems to be implying SMP, uniform SMP. Did I understand that correctly? So uh, those modifications, basically, they, are, they were targeting like an SMP-like uh, type of system, uh, which is, <coughs> that you can run and see the results on the IT, which is basically SMP, uh, but uh, yes. Oh, okay, so uh, in practice, uh, there could be uh, architectures that it's neither big or little or conventional SMP, right? Uh, can those kind of system be easily adapted with this framework? The uh, uh, what do you mean? I mean, if they are not big leap. Well, for example, the MediaTek externally actually has three clusters. Each of them oh, has yeah. different 
it, yeah, that's uh, another, yes, I mean, in principle, yes, the approach is actually general. Uh, we didn't actually have uh, real data showing uh, yet is actually, uh, anything, but that, that the approach is actually working and it, it can be adapted to different uh, type of topologies. Yuri mentioned the two code lines. They are, they are two different implementations out of necessity, but the concepts are the same. And conceptually speaking, a tri-cluster system like the one you alluded to should fit, right? What I want to call out is that from an energy modeling concept, so long as the energy model is the abstraction of your topology, all of this stuff <coughs> will work. But when you want to tune it, specifically for the UX aspects, you will probably have to make changes over there, right? It is our intent to uh, broaden the coverage of this work on topologies like that as well. For what it's worth, within ARM, we've done some modeling-based um, scenarios of those kind of platforms, and insofar as the basic mechanics go of EAS, that required no modification, it just worked. If you get into the territory of I have a specific use case which is latency sensitive, then you probably will have to do some special casing over there. Yeah. So you would change the UI to be part yeah, of the exactly. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, that, yeah that, that, that is part of the tuning this thing for a specific product. I mean, there will be uh, some. You, sh you should attend uh, my, my friend John Sturz's <laughs> uh, presentation here. John's sitting here. John's done the high key uh, user space adaptations for Android. So that will give you an ins insight into the kind of thing you probably will need to do there. Yeah, it's part of the AOSP mini summit, yeah. Thursday. <coughs> Any other question? So every patches uh, go to RSK first, and then uh, USP, right? Uh, yeah, basically how it's supposed to work is that uh, on LSK we have basically the same uh, expression, I mean the same code that is uh, currently on, on IOSP, Sorry. and then there will be board support, platform support, and then uh, basically you can actually pick whichever code lines to make your changes to propose the new patch. But then it will be basically the upstream thing will be the RSP. Okay. So that 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 my else this drawing I feel like is a little bit specific to the Android flavor of LSK, uh -huh. and so for other LSKs that a little bit to be determined. So, but we'll plan to have a solution. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah um, so comparing things to our old current way of doing it without EAS, um, do you have like any metrics for comparisons you've done uh, against you know, old scheduler and old uh, CPU freak? Like we use typically interactive governor on Android. So do you have like any uh, metrics you're tracking like uh, with responsiveness or performance on set, set of tasks or something? to compare how things will look, um, you know, as we move forward to with EAS? Yeah, basically, uh, as I was showing here, basically here I was modifying, I mean, I was uh, changing uh, configuration options of ES or the governor, but in principle you can do the same type of analysis comparing ES with whatever other scheduler uh, you actually have and get the same type of numbers and then say and see if you are better or not. That's basically the same. That's basically what happened, actually. Yes. There's data that's available for like kind of development boards that are open and accessible, and then there's data that's been done for productization and we don't have uh, that data in a shareable form. Right? 
Yeah, sure. I mean, the slides will be uh, uploaded, right? If they're not yet there, but yes. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. So uh, you were talking about metrics. So I'm, I'm giving a presentation actually on benchmarking um, Schedutil and Android. So that'll cover some different metrics. I did some testing also of their tree. So they had combined EAS with Schedutil, which is the latest scheduler guided frequency governor that's upstream. And then uh, you're I think you have more data in a hacking session right, yes. that you were going to provide as well. So there's lots more there if you want. That's, it's just the governor aspect of it. But there is more information there. One thing to point out is that uh, the, the Lisa session, which Patrick will do now. No, it's uh, now. I think, I think it's after this thing. Yeah, I'm not sure where, but yeah. So there is tooling available that can help with performing those kind of analysis at a very fine grain, right? Yeah. Right. A any other questions from anyone? Okay, well, thank you all very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for attending. Thank you.